Hello, my dudes. My name is Tiffany. Welcome back to my series, Internet Analysis, where I like to research and discuss things relevant to social issues and media. Today's question is, why do so many YouTubers stop posting once they get popular? First of all, I haven't posted in a few weeks, so this is relevant. But this topic has been on my list for a while and I'm very interested in it as both a viewer and a creator. I was initially inspired by a blog post from Sophia Nygaard, so I'm going to be talking about some of those specific points throughout this video. And by the way, before we begin, I did uh, try to bleach my hair myself. It is not done, it's not perfect, and I badly need a haircut. I'm also using my backup camera today because I had to send my main camera away for repairs. Everything's different. So think of any of your favorite YouTubers. Have some of them disappeared? Maybe they only post once a month or a few times a year? What happened? As usual, I asked you guys about this on my Instagram and I got a lot of replies for specific creators, including Best Dressed, Sophia Nygaard, Bethany Moda, Prime Inc, Elle Mills, Tana Mojo, and Dan Howell. I'm just laughing because that is such a wide range of types of creators, a lot of different genres. So this shows that this is not just limited to one part of YouTube, it's pretty common across the board. Some popular YouTubers seem to disappear overnight while other ones just kind of fade away. The gaps between their uploads increasing until they just stop posting altogether. So let's look into the typical cycle of YouTubing and what it's like to have your channel start to gain some momentum, blow up, so to speak. This had always been my biggest goal because I've been on YouTube very long more than half my life. Okay. So this is what it tends to be like when your channel is suddenly blowing up. The algorithm likes you. It starts to promote your videos to lots of people. You'll probably get comments from people saying, the algorithm recommended this to me. Thanks, YouTube overlords. This creator is probably posting very frequently, very fun, casual videos. Maybe they're mixing things up, trying different things, seeing what sticks. And as they're gaining success, they're probably posting even more often, maybe multiple times a week. Because when you're first getting this momentum, obviously, you want it to continue, you feel motivated, that momentum is really exciting, you're getting a lot of encouragement from your new viewers, and you're definitely on a high. Plus, when you're perceived as a small channel, you tend to get even more praise. People will say things like, wow, such high quality content from a small creator, or you deserve a million subscribers. Hey, by the way, I'm using a lot of my favorite creators videos as b-roll right now, that doesn't necessarily mean they're examples of the entire phenomenon that I'm describing. I'm not saying that they will inevitably stop posting, I'm just using them because I like them and I wanted to add some visual spice. So these channels will gain a lot of subscribers, they'll hit these major milestones, they'll get the YouTube plaques, then they promise lots of great exciting content coming soon. And you know, they'll post and they'll post and then things might slow down. Why? Why is my new fave barely posting anymore? They get this big audience and suddenly they're ghosting us? You feel betrayed as a viewer. You might think they're lazy or they're ungrateful. Or you might, you know, have a little more compassion and understanding and think maybe they're going through something. We'll see. <laughs> so let's get into it. Why do popular YouTubers disappear? There are kind of two paths. So one path could be they just want to focus on quality over quantity, especially with a growing audience. There's more pressure. You want to make sure your new viewers like your content and stick around. So you want to make sure everything is good, high quality, great stuff. Like a lot of the video essayists and commentary channels that I watch, some of them only post once a month, but that video is incredible and it's long and it's got costuming and soundtracks and you can see, you know, where all that effort has gone. The other path would just be the slowing down, sporadic uploads, the videos seem a little bit low quality or rushed, or sometimes they seem like they were just posted to throw up a sponsorship, which hey, you know, we get deadlines. That is a reason that we have to post sometimes, but it sucks as a viewer if you're watching it and the video doesn't really seem like anything. It just seems like something they threw up just to post a video. First reason popular YouTubers may disappear. Honestly, you can afford to work less. A big part of growing a successful YouTube channel is creating a large catalog of high quality videos. Videos. So if someone likes one video, there is plenty more for them to watch. This catalog also helps the creator and it helps you kind of stabilize your earnings or make sure a little bit of AdSense money is still coming in because while those older videos are still getting views, you're still getting paid. Once they reach a certain point, influencers can make a lot of money for very little work. It's an extremely privileged way to earn income, especially as proven throughout this pandemic. It's a major privilege to work for yourself online and have a flexible schedule. 
But I want to acknowledge that most people in the U.S. and other areas around the world are not in this privileged position. They cannot afford to work less. Many people work more than 40, 50, 60 hours per week and still aren't earning a living wage. Next reason is increased pressure. This is something I have dealt with. That often is my biggest downfall. Obviously, as you are getting more views, you're getting more subscribers, there is way more pressure to make content that people will enjoy, and you have more different types of personalities to cater to. Of course, you're not gonna be able to please everyone, but I think a lot of us try, even though we know that it is impossible because you just got to this point finally where people are paying attention to you and your content and you don't wanna lose it. You don't wanna make everyone unsubscribe or forget about you. A lot of creators experience this perfectionism where we want our videos to reach a certain standard that we have for ourselves or that we think our viewers have for us. And it makes it really hard to post anything that we feel doesn't meet that standard. Standard. I definitely struggle with this a lot. Sometimes I want to do a more casual laid back video, but then I'm like, oh, but that's not internet analysis. That's not, you know, in depth enough. There's not enough research or I don't have any mind blowing points to make, which I usually don't, to be honest. Anyway, that's why a lot of creators will start to post a little less often so that they can put more effort into those videos and at least make sure what they're putting out, again, is good quality. Another thing that was hard for me, like I mentioned before, is when you're first blowing up and people perceive you as a small channel and they're praising you and saying you're underrated, suddenly, if your channel grows really fast, you are seen and perceived as a big channel, a large popular creator, a successful YouTuber, but you might not feel like that yet. You might feel like the exact same person you were a few months ago. Nobody's gonna look at a channel that has a few hundred thousand subscribers or a few million and think, oh, that small indie YouTuber, even though that's who you might still feel like. So then you know people are looking at your channel, they're looking at your videos, they're seeing that sub count and going, does this video meet the expectations that I think people at this level should be reaching? Is this content worthy of having all these subscribers? You can go from being underrated to potentially being called overrated. They don't deserve this many subscribers. Why do so many people like this? It's just a mind fuck, to be honest. By the way, I started therapy yesterday, so cheers to that. I'm fine. It's just been a couple years in the making and I would like to start working on these, a lot of these issues, you know, my anxiety and stuff, but also work things and getting in my head. The longer since the last upload, the more pressure. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, when the hell are the videos? It's been two weeks. Oh my God. I can't explain, you know? Like, I want to do more. I'm constantly telling myself, like, I want to post more videos. I want to post more. <laughs> And somehow I get so overwhelmed that I don't do anything. I don't know what's wrong with me. You know, you're scared of losing that momentum. We are all under the control of the algorithm. And as creators, we think about it constantly. Like if I don't post enough, if I don't post what the algorithm wants, I'm not gonna get recommended anymore and everything is going to be ruined. So remember that blog post I mentioned by Sophia Nygaard? She's really been struggling with her channel for the past I don't know, maybe even up to two years now. And if you're a fan of her, I'm subscribed to her. You'd notice how long, you know, the gaps between the uploads would be. And a lot of viewers get frustrated. They go, oh, I love this channel, but where's the content? What are these people doing? Make us the videos. So this blog post addresses where they've been and she just writes out what she's been dealing with. Number one, a growing sense of failure. This first one is probably the most pervasive thing I've been feeling for a while and something that I think has gradually taken its toll on my productivity and ability to execute. She talks about how she feels chronically behind schedule and how she feels like she has been ever since they started the channel. Sophia says, this kind of ongoing mini failure after mini failure for three years straight has definitely affected my confidence in my own abilities. From the very beginning, I sort of felt like the channel was a wild horse that was dragging me behind it along for the ride. Since it started growing quickly from the beginning, I was too scared to stop and figure out how to build something sustainable underneath me for fear of losing momentum. I've just been finals week blitzing my way from posting three times a week to two times a week to four videos a month to two to three videos a month to one and now to none. 
And that really gets to me too, you know, this idea of my own productivity or unproductivity, but also the fact that other people can see it and other people know how long it's been and they might think that I'm lazy, that I'm doing nothing. And so much of YouTube work is not shown until a video is uploaded. And of course there's a lot behind the scenes. There's other things that YouTubers work on, but until you're uploading a video, it doesn't feel like you've done anything. And all of that really, again, does not help motivate you. And for me, if it's been a while since my last post, I feel compelled to come back with like a really high quality video, like something that is really impressive and it makes sense that it's been so long when really I'm suddenly scrambling last minute to try to get something out to just stop this buildup of expectations. Next we have basically being afraid of criticism, doubting yourself, and overthinking everything. The thing about criticism on YouTube is like everyone who posts on YouTube knows that you're gonna get hate comments, you're gonna get negative comments, that's part of posting things publicly online. There's definitely a pressure to be perfect because you don't want to have to face those nitpicky comments or more serious criticism. Criticism is valid. Again, I don't want to act like, oh, woe is us, the poor YouTubers. For me, I've gotten in the habit of anticipating criticism before I'm even filming. As I'm writing a video, that's kind of in the back of my mind or all of the disclaimers that I put into the my videos or the way that I speak now, all of these qualifiers, and I do like to include nuance in my videos, but sometimes I can tell I'm overdoing it because I'm trying so hard to phrase things the way that I mean it because I don't want people to misconstrue what I'm saying. I don't want my words to be twisted or taken out of context. But even then, like if I'm saying anything of value, even if I say it perfectly, I know that there are going to be people who disagree with me and might criticize me for saying the thing that I believe. But anticipating the criticism makes it really hard to get on camera because as I'm reading my script or you know filming any other videos, I get so inside of my head and I start doubting myself and it takes away a lot of the fun because I'm already scared of what feedback I might get that's less than positive. Back to Sophia's blog post, she wrote about listening to third-party negativity. Something else that's been slowly chipping away at my confidence has been taking on and overly internalizing third-party opinions and criticisms, such as critical comments like, you talk too slow, you over-enunciate, your voice is monotone and boring, you can't pronounce clothes, you sound too scripted, you sound pretentious have caused me to second guess myself when I'm doing things that used to be easy for me. I've turned on the camera or the microphone to record and little voices start creeping in. Talk faster, don't sound so pretentious. People criticize the way you say that word. Start over, say it again, but correctly this time. And my mouth gets dry, my throat closes up, I start stuttering and I have to walk away and essentially try again the next day and see if I can overcome those thoughts then. Again, YouTubers know that we're going to have to face these comments about our appearances and the way that we speak, the way we dress, how we interact with others, any possible thing that people can comment on. These things that have started to creep in my head that make me self-edit and second-guess myself as I film and make me overanalyze my appearance, especially as I watch myself on screen while I edit. It can be really hard to get through editing, especially if you do it yourself, you're listening to a lot of your own voice, you're watching your own face, looking at your own body. I actually talked about this at the end of one of my recent newly reviews on my second channel, but basically I was having a bad body image time and it was literally difficult for me to look at myself. And that wasn't even about anticipating negative comments or anything from my viewers, but just myself. That's what my work requires. It's a lot of overloading yourself with yourself. And if you're in any sort of a negative state of mind, that is difficult to impossible. Next reasons, you may lose passion, run out of ideas, or burn out. This is pretty self-explanatory, but it is very hard to try to be creative and be entertaining on a consistent basis. Throughout the years, the upload expectations on YouTube have changed. It used to be multiple times a week, and now, you know, once or twice a week is pretty standard. But even then, to consistently be expected back to back to always have great new ideas, better than before, it's just really hard. It's hard to constantly be putting out new things, feel like you have new things to say or new things to present when really we're, we're not that interesting. There's usually not that much inspiration that strikes, you know, week to week. Maybe creators are just not passionate about YouTube as a platform anymore, or maybe they just feel too stuck in the genre or style of video 
where they gained most of their viewers and therefore feel like they have to stay in that because if they move outside of that, people might unsubscribe or stop watching. And lastly, we have any other personal issues like anybody would have with their work or with their life. Mental health is a big struggle, especially with online creators. For me, my anxiety gets in the way of my work very frequently, whether it's just general anxiety or my health anxiety, makes it hard for me to be able to focus, to write, to research, and especially to film. It can be very hard to get on camera sometimes. Hey, my camera just died and I had to wait like two hours for it to recharge. Continuing, of course, Sometimes YouTubers disappear because they're moving on to other projects outside of YouTube. So I got a lot of replies on my Instagram, again, of people saying that these creators just thought of YouTube as just a stepping stone to other opportunities, that they just wanted to get famous, get popular on this platform, and then leave it to go do better things. I do agree that, especially in early YouTube, the thought was, you can use this internet fame to platform a more mainstream entertainment career, whether that is acting or hosting or music, because YouTube and social media weren't thought of as legitimate jobs. Like, most people didn't even know there was any money to be made in that sector. So I feel like a lot of YouTubers felt like if they ever want any legitimacy or an actual reputation in the industry, they're gonna have to move beyond YouTube. I mean, there are still YouTubers today who would like to, to move out of the YouTube realm for various reasons. I don't think that's necessarily out of a disrespect to YouTube or the platform, but just it's not something that they want to do forever. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> What is happening? Bit of a chaotic filming situation today. Ultimately, I think it's pretty wise to want to build something outside of yourself, build a brand or a company or whatever that doesn't just rely on you being relevant, making videos with your face on YouTube. So some examples of YouTubers that have stepped back or disappeared from YouTube include Liza Koshy. A lot of people mentioned her as a big popular YouTuber that is basically not on YouTube anymore. She has definitely pursued a lot more mainstream opportunities. And then on another hand, Simply Nail Logical, Christine, I have mentioned in a, a video about YouTubers leaving their nine to fives. Christine's situation is very interesting because she did take a step back from her main channel because she this whole time has still had a day job working for the Canadian government, plus, she created her Holo Taco nail polish brand, and she does a podcast, which I do love. I listen to it. So now she's at a point where she can just upload when she wants, when she can, and it gets to be a hobby again, which I think is really nice. Then of course, we've also seen shifts to other platforms, whether it's Instagram, TikTok, or Twitch, or even creating a podcast, which sometimes podcasts are still posted on YouTube, like my podcast. It's called Previously Gifted, but you can also listen on any podcast app. I can see why people would wanna switch to Instagram, for example, depending on the type of content that you do, if you do more lifestyle or fashion-based content. Being able to earn a living on Instagram seems pretty nice. <laughs> like, I don't want to imply that doing sponsorships or whatever or being an Instagram creator is easy in any way. I mean, I'm terrible at it. I never fucking post on my feed. My pictures are not good. I don't have an aesthetic. I know there's talent involved, but I think when it comes to creating a whole video with a sponsorship versus planning a campaign, taking those photos, giving those deliverables to the brand and posting on Instagram, I would say Instagram's easier. Uh, hot take. And then with TikTok, I didn't realize that TikTok was so lucrative, but like obviously we see the Charlie D'Amelio's and we see the Addison Rays and they are making bank from TikTok, but also the other opportunities that come from being so famous from TikTok. And then Twitch, I'm gonna talk about in a second. Something I'm interested in is why YouTubers are shifting from their main channels to their second channels. I don't know if this is something you guys have seen depending on who you watch, but here in the commentary sphere, I've seen a lot of creators have their main channel, which has millions of subscribers, and then they create a side channel where they create similar content, but like a little lower quality, still good, but like easier to make, quicker to make, maybe shorter videos. 
and there's less pressure because it's the second channel. It's chill here, you know? We have Cody Co and his side channel, which is called Cody and Co. And essentially now it's like, you can flip a coin to see like, is this video gonna show up on one channel or the other because they're essentially the same. Same thing with D'Angelo Wallace. Uh, D'Angelo has multiple channels. He does have distinct differences between the styles and the formats of those channels, but there's something about having two channels with different expectations that is comforting as a creator. So like if one channel takes a lot more mental energy and creativity, the other one's a little bit easier to just be loosey goosey and go on there. That can be helpful and that can be motivating. That can help encourage your creativity. So I'm all for it. Plus your audience, your biggest fans can check out both channels. It's not that difficult to subscribe to multiple channels and get that sweet content. Another interesting thing related to this is that another trend is creators streaming on Twitch and then also having that footage re-edited for YouTube to go on a side channel or something like that. So again, D'Angelo has been doing that. I think Cody does that. Noelle Miller, lots of other channels are doing that. That's a very clever way of monetizing the same content twice. I've also seen shifts in like the lifestyle sides of YouTube from going from your main channel to more of a second channel vlog channel, like Zoella, Zoe Shug. Is that how you pronounce her last name? Zoella has done that. She hasn't really posted on her main channel, even though it has millions and millions more subscribers in, I don't know, a year or more, but she's more active on her vlog channel. And I can see that if you get to a point where you can consistently get a high number of views, great sponsorships on your second channel, I can see why people choose to do that, especially with vlogs. I find them to be, again, a little bit more easy to do because you're always doing something every day. So there's something to film. You've got the content there. It's not quite as high effort to record because if it's a casual vlog channel, it's just what you're doing. Then you edit it and you post it compared to main channel videos, which can feel a lot more intimidating. Again, because of that increased pressure, increased viewership. But my main takeaway from this is that these smaller second channels feel like a closer knit community and there's less pressure. It's probably your most loyal viewers who would be watching that content. So all around you might be getting better positive feedback and a lower amount of stress because it's just a little bit easier to make that content. Lastly, I recently watched this video by As Told by Kenya, basically about, you know, the complications of being a YouTuber and why she loves Patreon as a platform. Kenya basically said that Patreon feels like a more fun, carefree, positive space to discuss certain topics, especially things that she doesn't feel comfortable posting publicly on YouTube anymore because she doesn't want to face that fully public comment section. And of course, naturally, your patrons are your biggest supporters. They're literally paying you because they love your content and they want to support you. And not that many people would be willing to pay you money to intentionally come into your Patreon and like, misinterpret you or twist your words or argue with you in bad faith. So you're probably gonna have a pretty controlled community. Plus, if you ever had any problems on your Patreon, you could just block them and remove them as patrons. That was a very illuminating video. I could relate to a lot of it. It made me think, maybe I should start a Patreon. I've gotta figure that out. But check out Kenya's video if you're interested. Ultimately, my biggest takeaway from this whole video is that content creators are craving smaller, more intimate spaces again, which is the weird paradox of the fact that when you reach your peak popularity or you're finally a big successful popular YouTuber, that is the time when you actually want to step back the most because of all the factors that I mentioned. So when you're a small channel, even though you want to grow, you want to be more successful, you want to get more views, make more money. There's also a lot of charm and there are a lot of nice parts of being a small channel and having that very loyal, tight-knit audience. Back in the day, I could read all of my comments. I could reply to as many comments as I wanted. And I recognized so many of my viewers' usernames and profile pictures that it really did feel like a community. So obviously as your audience is growing, you're really grateful for those new viewers and you're happy to see more interaction, but there's no way you can keep up with that. You can't possibly read all those comments anymore. You can't recognize all these faces. And it just makes you miss that tight knit community, that closeness, that intimacy. Plus when your viewers are new, they may love you right away and subscribe and they watch a lot of your videos, but they don't know you as deeply because they haven't watched you throughout the years. So it's just different and it changes the atmosphere. Like I have viewers who may still be watching now who have literally been watching me for over 10 years. 
That is wild. Thank you for watching. Can't believe it. But I would assume that they would get me or understand me more than maybe a new casual viewer might just because they've been around and they've seen me go through so much shit. You know, it's still a parasocial relationship, but they know me pretty well compared to a new viewer that might like me and then watch another video and not like me because I said something that they don't agree with or they didn't understand or I didn't give context for. This is my wise thing here. If you're not understanding all of this, do you have a Finsta? Interesting question, <laughs> if I do say so myself. I think this desire for a close-knit, intimate community is the exact reason why lots of people, ordinary people, not necessarily internet figures, but probably us too, have Finstas because we built up our main accounts to be the big flashy space where you wanna gain followers and you wanna get likes and you wanna post the best pictures. But then that pressure of, you know, making your feed look good and thinking of the right caption gets so exhausting that you're not even enjoying Instagram anymore and you're overthinking it. So you make a Finsta, you let your closest friends follow you and you get to go back to having these very casual, intimate conversations or interactions, or you just get to shit post, which is what you originally did on Instagram or on YouTube. And it's just nice to go back to that. There's no more pressure to be perfect or to be, you know, funny all the time or whatever that you now feel on your main page. That was my biggest breakthrough of this video was I was like, okay, as unrelatable and privileged as popular YouTubers seem and are, oh, I'm sorry, you have to make videos you get tired of making videos and making so much money. It's like, yeah, I know, I know. It is certainly a privilege, 100%. But it is valid that there are a lot of stresses and a lot of pressures, and it makes sense that even somebody with a big following can still be vulnerable to collapsing under that pressure and feeling trapped in a space that was supposed to be freeing and motivating. So yeah, it's been really interesting. Now I'm thinking a lot about that, that shift of like, I think most people would prefer having a Patreon-esque situation. Like there's the vanity and the ego aspect of wanting like more and more followers. Like you want those numbers to be high. But if you could compare, say, I don't know, getting 100,000 views on YouTube, but like a bunch of hate comments that mess with your mental health versus having a thousand patrons and being able to have discussions on Patreon and making an income that way, like how would you weigh that? I think, I think at a point you do feel the need to shift to a smaller space just to reset that community. Last thing that I wanna to touch on, this is so random, but for those of you who stuck around, let me tell you. So going back to the beginning, the idea that YouTubers, popular YouTubers can afford to take time off, I've always thought, oh yeah, that's cool. Like, you know, they're, they're making a little bit of passive income from their older uploads anyway. Like, plus they're, you know, still getting jobs on other platforms sponsored Instagram or TikTok or podcast or whatever. But then I looked at the numbers of some of the people that I'm talking about and like the amount of money that they are making passively from all the content that they've already created that's in their catalog. Like shit, I would be taking time off YouTube too. I would disappear if I was making this amount of money and let me tell you. So Sophia, for example, I didn't even realize how many views she gets. She has like 9 million subscribers. Her channel has almost 1.5 billion views with a B. Right now, she is getting five times more views as me in a month, and she's not even uploading. Like when I'm having a good month posting new videos, you know, doing okay, she's doing five times that passively. That scared the shit out of me. I looked on Social Blade. Sophia used to get between 30 to 50 million views per month. That is wild. I don't even know how much AdSense revenue that brings in. It hurts me to think about it. It's unfathomable. Like on a good month, I get like one to two to three million views, woo! And I'm good, that AdSense check is very helpful, pays my bills and everything. So anyway, this is why the passive residual income, if you are a channel that is massive and has a big catalog of videos that have gotten millions and millions of views and continue to get millions of views, even when you're not uploading, again, I can see why they're chilling. I'm like, oh, you're making, I don't know, let's just throw out a number. You're making 30 grand a month passively just from your AdSense, from your old video catalog. Woo! It's always hard to estimate AdSense earnings because they vary widely depending on CPM, genre, and other factors. 
For Sophia's videos, since they're all pretty long, she likely has mid-roll ads, which means she'll earn more money. And also, top-tier YouTubers get preferred ads, meaning they're paid at a higher rate to begin with. All of this is just my speculation, but it is fascinating. Let's look at Logan Paul as another example. Obviously, he used to do daily vlogging, and during that time, he could get anywhere from 50 million views a month up to 150 million views. Recently, his channel has shifted. He's only been posting about once a month in the past few months, but still, in the last month, he got almost 34 million views. Interesting. <laughs> now I'm just thinking, like, okay, what do you do? when you have that much money. Like, yeah, you pay a lot in taxes, as you should. I'm sorry, you can spare a few millions. You're chilling. But what do you do with that? By the way, sorry, last thing. I just keep going, the video never ends. I have been meaning to do this for a long time. I've been inspired by Thought Slime and his eyeball zone, but now it's not called that, it's called something else. I want to promote smaller channels because again, I know how hard it is to get your little jump start and sometimes a little shout out or a mention can really help kickstart your channel. So I think I'm going to create a Google submission form. It'll be in the description. If you are a YouTuber and you consider yourself to be a small YouTuber, please submit yourself. Send me a video that you think I would like and I will check it out. Let me know your name, your pronouns, how you describe your channel or your content. I want to start doing this. I want to start doing this. So thank you so much. I should stop this video. I can't stop. Please check out my second channel for more casual videos. Ooh, it's a smaller, tight-knit community there. You'll love it. Also, my podcast is called Previously Gifted. It's on podcast apps and on YouTube if you want to watch it. I'm not the most consistent on any of my channels, but that's okay. Okay, thanks. Bye.